He will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. 1st Enoch, chapter 48, verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Good evening, giant killers, dragon slayers, but not vampire hunters. We talked about that. You are listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast. My co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, is with me from Lafayette, Louisiana, Cajun country. And I'm Father Andrew Stephen Damick in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, on the very edge of Pennsylvania Dutch land. And if you're listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO, 855-237-2346. Matushka Trudy is taking your calls tonight, and it is her birthday. So if you call, you had better wish Matushka Trudy a happy birthday. I will have her write down the names of those who did not. Um, also, gonna... also, if you call in, speak quietly. I'm still recovering from Mardi Gras. Oh, yeah. well, you, you do live in Louisiana. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So please call. We'll get to your calls in the second part of the show. Lord of Spirits is brought to you by our listeners and also by Chrysostom Academy. A lot of you listeners out there work from home, and if you're telecommuting, you can probably live almost anywhere. If you're a parent of school-age kids and you're like me, working from a virtual office, One of your big considerations for where you live is where your kids go to school. I love living in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania, and part of why is because my kids go to Chrysostom Academy. I'm not kidding. It's true. And it's a pan-Orthodox classical school with elementary through high school students. It's on a beautiful 55-acre campus, has the highest academic standards, and is focused not just on educating the mind, but forming the whole person in Christ. So if you don't live here yet, think about moving to the Lehigh Valley and sending your kids to Chris Austin Academy. And even if you don't telecommute, our local economy is growing. There are actual jobs here. And we've got eight Orthodox parishes in our metro area. So you can visit chrysostomacademy.org. Again, that's chrysostomacademy.org to see what I'm talking about. We could get a a legion of people to head over there and make peeps. (laughs) That's true. They make peeps not too far from where Chris Austin Academy is located. There you go. Your children will learn. You will actually true. It's actually true. Also, Dwayne the Rock Johnson is from Chris Austin. Is not from Chris Austin Academy. He's from (laughs) Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That's a claim you can't back up. (laughs) I know. I know. I think he went to Liberty High School. Maybe I'm not sure. Which I don't. I'm not advertising that. Um, yeah, the big, the only really big drawback if you come here and send your kids to that school is that in some level, on some level, you will have me as your neighbor. So, sorry, I've sorry. successfully disrupted everything. Go ahead, indeed. <laughs> but yes, uh, we, uh, my wife and I, love having our kids there. It's it's great. Um, it's it's really fantastic. We're so glad, so glad it's there. Also, so one more, uh, one more little ad. We're still selling tickets for our Lord of Spirits conference on October 26th through 29th, 2023. Right now, only commuter tickets are available. That means you got to get your own hotel room or someplace to stay, Airbnb, whatever, because y'all have sold out the lodging at the Antiochian Village. You maniacs. You can still go to store.ancientfaith.com slash events to get your ticket. And there are actually not even that many commuter tickets left. It's pretty, they say that, pretty nuts. Uh, they say that Mr. Durden is building an army. <laughs> well, the first rule of Lord of Spirits Club, it, wait. No, you so, can't talk about the convention. That's right. That's right. Tonight, tonight, we continue our conversations on the sacraments of the church, and we're talking about the holy mystery of unction. 
which can be slippery to get our minds around. What does it do? Why don't we see miracles every time it's applied? Is sin related? And so on. So where are we going to start this time, Father Stephen? Should we just go ahead and start with Genesis? I, I think somewhere someone has probably mapped out, right, like the broad structure of a Lord of Spirits episode. Right. There's just a generic Lord of Spirits episode out there that yeah. anyone can do at home now. You know, actual topic in the third half, right? <laughs> <laughs> like starting somewhere in the murky depths of prehistory. Right. Working our way through. Um, I did want to comment before we get started. Yes. Uh, on a more st- serious note on uh, the passing of Dr. Michael Heiser. Um, which I wanted to comment on for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of our audience is very familiar with his work. Um, some people have gone from reading his work to becoming part of our audience and other folks, vice versa. Um, and because we don't, other than friend of the show, Bart Ehrman, <laughs> uh, we don't, we don't comment on a lot of people, um, on the show, right? We, occasionally we get things, you know, why, why don't we, why didn't, don't we talk about him, uh, people hypothesizing various theories as to why we don't talk about him and this and that. And and so with his passing earlier this week, I wanted to kind of clarify things regarding that and say a few words. As I mentioned, we, I at least don't like talking other than friend of the show, Bart Ehrman. I don't like um, talking about people. I have as a general policy to be ruthless with ideas and compassionate with people. Um, so when you don't talk about people, you just talk about ideas. It looks a lot less like a personal attack and more like just critique and give and take and working out ideas. Uh, century Germans, though, are fair game. Yeah. Yeah. But even then, I rarely name them. That's true. Um, so and, and uh, Dr. Heiser was a firm believer in the peer review process. Um. One of the things, obviously, I didn't know him personally. As far as I know, he didn't know I existed, right? Um, but beyond pretty much anyone else I've encountered, <laughs> right, in academia and scholarship, right, he thoroughly believed in the peer review process, in give and take, in in, in hashing things out in that way, uh, in the community of scholars. He literally, on his deathbed, had new issues of journals on his nightstand in case he wanted to read. Hmm. That's how dedicated he was to to scholarship. And I have never and never plan on saying anything negative about his published peer-reviewed scholarly work on the Old Testament, which is top-notch. Obviously, in terms of some of the popular stuff... He was an evangelical, I'm an Orthodox priest, so we're coming at things from different perspectives and we're integrating the scholarly data in different ways in our viewpoints. Uh, There were times back in the day when when I was still in the dark realm of social media where I know, and probably some people remember, I publicly disagreed with him about some things, but again – that was part of this give and take, right? When, despite my policy of not wanting on this show to get into personalities and stuff, when a scholar looks at another scholar's work and takes it seriously and thinks it's important enough to try to critique it, that's actually a compliment. That means that you have a very high impression of that person. When someone publishes garbage, you don't bother to respond to it. (laughs) When someone publishes something important or puts something out there that's important, that's where you step in and you critique it. Um, So uh, mainly I wanted to make that plain because I didn't want any more rumors and weirdness about things. Um, And uh, on the whole, I want to say memory eternal to – Servant of God, Michael departed this life, and that uh, my prayers, at least, 
uh, will continue to be with his family and with him since I'm Orthodox. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I didn't want to sort of pass that over in silence, um, with his passing this week. So now we have to figure out how to get out of that mood (laughs) and into our topic for tonight. (laughs) So needs more giggling. Yeah, exactly. More. We'll just recitations of the word, right? Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So, yeah. Back to Genesis. <laughs> Back to Genesis. We're talking yes. talk about okay. Yes. So. so we are indeed beginning at the beginning, uh, which is a very good place to start. Um, and uh, so tonight we're talking about, as you mentioned, uh, the mystery of holy unction, uh, also known as the anointing of the sick. Um, which is practiced in the Orthodox Church. In some Orthodox churches, uh, as mine, it is administered to everyone on Holy Wednesday or at another time in Holy Week um, and is also administered to the sick. Um, That said, the place where we're starting out tonight may not look like it's directly related to that. Um. Unless this is your first time listening, you're used to that by now. Right. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> the question is, how will they get there? Yes, yes. Yeah, how will yeah, you we know, get actually, from where we're starting? I had, I had someone contact me recently and say, could you guys just like release the bits you do at the end, like as a separate like clip show or whatever? And it's like, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. But the reason why that stuff at the end is meaningful is because of the road that we walked. Yes. It's about the journey, not the destination. Yeah, man. (laughs) It's the friends we made along the way. Yeah. There we go. Uh, There I go being a surfer boy again. (laughs) Um, So, yeah. So, where the uh, the place where we're starting is essentially who are you? Indeed. Who? 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 I really want to know. Anyway. Um. And who are you? Meaning, what is what is a human person? What is a soul? What is a body? How do they relate to each other? And so, to get into that, of course, we have to go back to Genesis. We have to go to Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, to the creation of Adam, the creation of the creation of man. Yeah, and this is a passage we've talked about before in other contexts. Um, that's the cool stuff. That's one of the cool things about, especially the beginning of Genesis is you can talk about these chapters from a gazillion different angles and they're all very fruitful, not to mix my metaphors too much, but yes. So Genesis chapter two, verse seven, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. And the man became a living creature or sometimes it's translated. He became a living soul, right? A living soul. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this, of course, gets uh, quoted later by St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15.45 when he compares uh, that to the relationship between Christ and the Spirit who gives life. But that's a rabbit trail we won't go down uh, this evening because uh, – that's one of the trickiest verses in the Bible to translate. I mean, um, you're the rabbit, though, so I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, don't know what to do with that. It's our year, man. That's what all the Chinese people tell me is that because it's the year of the rabbit, this is our year. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying. Okay. Yes. So what is so the soul? You father? say you want me to go for it on first. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. I was just I'd throwing that out. Clarify. Maybe I mean, I could. On but. some future episode where we're yeah. feeling like we need to go for four hours. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what do we see here, right? So he becomes a living being, a living soul, right? right? When the when the breath of life is breathed into him, right? And so um, I'll just I'll, – I'll say early on. Sorry, Platonists. You're really going to take it on the chin for this one. Um, so the soul here is not a thing. It's not a glowing orb that rises right. up out of your chest when you die. It's not shaped in any way. Yeah. Or a green mist that Shang Tsung eats. Right. No. Um, 
it's it's not a thing. It's not an object, right? So you have Adam's body is formed, right? And then that form, that body is given life. And so nefesh in Hebrew, right, psiki in Greek is a way of referring to that life, the life of the living thing. And so as we mentioned before on the show, everything that's alive has a soul. Right. If you are animate, yeah, if you're animate, you have a soul. Pun intended for you Latin speakers. Um, Animate and inanimate literally means sold and soulless (laughs) in Latin. Um, So, but there are different types of souls, right? So yes, animals have souls. No, those souls are different than human souls, right? They're not, they're not identical. Your dog has a dog soul. Yes. Yes, and your tree has a tree soul. Um, so what that reveals, right, when we talk about the type of soul, the type of life that is in a particular type of body, and particular type of body is exactly the kind of language that St. Paul uses in First Corinthians 15 to talk about animals and people and right the type of life that's in that particular type of body is directly related to that body. You can just trade out souls. Right. They can't like, like migrate back and forth between ghost in the shell and, and cats and a human or freaky Friday. Um, <laughs> so, There's well, that's two humans, but we'll get there. That's true. Um, yeah, that's true. But still. Yeah. So, um, this shows that that life, right, the life of that body, being a particular type of life, also reveals that the soul, that life, is an organizing principle of that body. Right. And and often when that's being discussed, the word spirit gets used because, you know, see the spirits episode, right, where we talked about spirit as being the kind of as the animating force, the organizing principle, the thing that's pulling everything and making it go, so to speak. I don't want to use a puppet metaphor too much, but you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you could, you could, so you could groom a wolf to look like a German shepherd. Right. Right. But it would still be a wolf, not a dog. Part because it has wolf soul, not dog soul. Right. And when it's overly specific, but it's hungry like a wolf. Yes. Not like a dog. Not like a dog. Um, so the 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 type of life, the type of soul that is in the body, organizes right the body. And if you stopped grooming that wolf, it would go back to looking like a wolf. Um, and and you know the acorn will always grow into an oak tree. It will never grow into a fig tree. Right, because the the what it is is already there in the life, right, that it has, even as the body changes. I mean, I have, um, I have each of those in my yard, and the, the acorns that the oak tree gives off never become fig trees. So I've, I've done this with science. So. Can verify. Yes. Many such cases. That's right. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so this is why, right, so sometimes, and we've, we've brushed over this before in previous episodes, Sometimes there are places, arguably in the scriptures, definitely in in the church fathers, uh, where um, the soul and the spirit are or are not distinguished from each other. Yeah, I mean, in patristic models, you get both, you know, human beings are body and soul, and then also you get human beings are body, soul, and spirit. Yes, or even body and spirit once in a while. Uh, mm mm-hmm. But um, so what's what's going on there? And so I I think we've at least once had a caller ask us that question, like which is it, right? Um, and so the what we have to remember here is that just because you make a distinction in speech, that doesn't mean there's an actual distinction, right? So you know you will see things like when the church fathers are talking about the Trinity, and they'll talk about like a ray of the sun. And it's warmth and yeah. it's light, right? Like you right. could talk about those things separately. 
You can talk about the warmth of the sun and the light of the sun, right? But in reality, those are not really two separate things. Right. Right. So, but you're able to distinguish those in speech. And so sometimes, right, the the fathers, when they separate soul and spirit as two different things, they're making that kind of distinction. That doesn't mean that they're actually two separate things because neither of those is a thing in the sense that we think about material objects, right? Yeah. Um, and And when that distinction is made, it's a distinction between just the life of something and life as that organizing principle. Yeah. So if you go back to our episode on, on what is a spirit when it's at home, right? We talk about how a spirit is sort of an organizing principle, like a higher level of collective consciousness, right? Um, and so that organizing principle aspect is what they're calling spirit when they separate the two. Yeah. And the soul is referring to just the life of, of the thing itself. Right. But you don't have to distinguish those. Right. And I mean, it's, it's maybe analogous, but not identical to, you know, I'm me, but then I'm also a father, but I, and my being a father are not two different things. You know, I'm still me when I'm, acting in a fatherly way, but that's, you know, we can talk about, we could talk about it, but it's still me the whole time. It's yeah. still husband, one. you father, you son, you are not different yous. Right. Exactly. They're partitioned from each other, but you could speak, we could speak about them separately. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's actually going on with a soul. So you can't picture a soul, <laughs> right? It doesn't look like anything. It is the life of a body, right? So when we're if you if you've seen someone or something die, what we're identify what what's called a soul is the difference between the thing when it was alive and the thing when it's dead, mm. the thing that's gone, right. which is not a material thing, right? right? We'll we'll, we'll not, talk a little bit more about why it's hard to talk about that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But so what tends to happen, especially in languages like Latin and English, both of them have a bad tendency to do this. This is why Heidegger said you could only do philosophy in Greek and German. Uh, not That's just because he was... at all. Yeah. Well, you know, he was a native <laughs> German speaker and his Greek was better than his Latin. So, you know, there might have been some influence there, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, English and Latin tend to reify things. Right. It's just the way that it kind of tends to work. And yeah. Yeah. And and with English, we've got articles to make it even more, <laughs> even more possible. Right. And, and uh, so. this, this causes all kinds of theological problems if you're not careful. Right. So people all the time in English will talk about Christ's human nature and his divine nature. Yeah, as though they're like separate things. Where his, that makes his it human sound like there's yeah doing this, <laughs> like they're two things, and that's yeah. Nestorianism. That's bad, right? Um, or talking about a soul as if it's a thing, right? In in this particular case, and that language is deceptive and plays into some bad conclusions, like the ones come to by uh, Plato. And uh, John Calvin. Yeah, there's going to be a whole lot of sorry Plato and sorry Calvin, and even some sorry Origin. Yes. Uh, in this yes. part of the podcast. We're going to be apologizing a lot. There's a lot of sorries. A lot of sorries. Um, this is how so, politics works. And the reason I rope in uh, John Calvin is uh, that he famously, um, to the chagrin, to be fair, of many Calvinists, <laughs> but. He quoted as true Plato's statement that the body is the prison house of the soul. Oh, John. (laughs) Not his best moment uh, by anyone's standards. Um, So um, he, he, you know, by doing that was buying into a lot of 
of bad presuppositions. Because, of course, for Plato, the soul is the self. Yeah, it's who you are. Right. You are your soul, which is in a body. Right. Like you're like it's a big mech. Yeah. <laughs> you're inside. That you're pulling some em- levers. Embodied. But that's not a particularly good thing. In fact, it's kind of a bad thing. Yeah, right. Right. right? And that's from, why from it's Peter. a prison house. Right. Yeah. Um, and the goal is to get out. Right. And so there are a number of things in Plato that flow from this. And that have been sort of wholesale adopted in in Western thought, like the idea that the soul is immortal. And by that, we don't mean that we think souls vanish and disappear or something uh, at some point, but the idea that the soul is innately immortal. Yeah, it's not able to be destroyed or to die. Yes, or... It's not able to die, right. Um, and... There are extreme forms of that when you veer into Gnosticism, right? Where it's some spark of, it's some element of God himself, right? Like some element of the divine essence in each person or something, right? But there's less extreme versions, which is just that the soul is, is, um, is immortal in and of itself, right? Not right, related which, to, yeah. Say, say that leads to all kinds of other conclusions, like that they pre-exist this human life, um, you know, right. looking they're at immortal origin. and go on forever. Yeah, <laughs> looking at you, origin. Looking at you, Mormons. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, to be fair to the Mormons, the Mormons did do think they came into being at a point. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Sorry, Mormons. So it's a little different. They it's do believe apology. they pre-exist embodiment, but not the way Plato and Origin. Yeah, we do have some Mormon listeners actually. So hey, uh, Mormons. Yeah. So be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But so that those are more or less unsubtle ways of of doing the preexistence of the human soul. There are more subtle ways, right? So, for example, uh, one of the more subtle ways would be, again, in Calvinism, where the human soul essentially preexists in the divine decree. Yeah, it's in the mind of God, and so therefore it right. has an existence. of Within the divine decree, in the eternal mind of God, not only just sort of a general sense of a person is going to come to exist, not just like God knows what's going to happen, but that person's actual character, every action they're going to take in their life, everything they're going to do, whether they're elect and going to go to heaven or reprobate and going to go to the bad place, all of that is reality before they come into being. Right. And so this is a more subtle way to do that, which is, which is not ultimately less, less problematic. Right. right? And because what it leads to, in any of those cases, and this is why I'm bringing Calvinism into that. It's not just to slander it and call them plate, slander them and call them plainness. Um, it's because in in any of those cases, what you end up with is uh, the and again, the Mormons. There's some nuance here, but um, you end up with human life on this earth just being the playing out of the identity of the soul that already exists. Hmm. So essence pre your your essence precedes your existence. Right. Right. And so, you know, that is this actually has a lot of I mean, this all sounds very philosophical and, and metaphysical yes. or whatever, uh, everybody. But it but it actually has some actual practical ways that this gets played out in the way that people think of themselves and the way they try to lead their lives and the way that they do their relationships. Yes. Right. Yeah. So we even talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. People who are pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> and their male spouses. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So I mean, people will talk about, like, I need to find yeah. out who I really am. Yeah. Oh, I was going to uh, say, I can't wait to meet this person. Oh, right. I can't wait to meet them. <laughs> Get to know who they are. Right? Yeah. Well, they're a fetus. They right, aren't anybody like, yet. They're a fetus. 
Yeah. They're human, but they, they don't have like a personality. Right. Right. They don't have a favorite flavor of ice cream. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> they don't have a favorite Shakespearean play. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, as much as I'm sure you've tried when when your wife was pregnant to play Kenneth Branagh productions sort of <laughs> at them in utero to get them to pick one. Hey, Much Ado About Nothing is a brilliant piece of modern cim- cinema. Okay. I enjoy it also, but <laughs> come on, man. At least go for Baby Mozart or something. Um, <laughs> right. So, yeah, the idea that... These things about you already exist, and they just kind of play themselves out. You just figure them out as you go through life. Yeah, and you're a and, good person or a bad person, right? Right, or or or, e- or even like this plays into the whole idea of like soulmates, for instance. Um, you know, I'm meant for this one other person because this is who we are from all eternity, or whatever. Um, I actually one of my favorite um, non non middle earth things that were ever said by by J.R. Tolkien is he said the soulmate is the person you're actually married to. I love that because it's about the the way that things actually are, not living in this virtual reality about how you think about things, but you know, life as it really is. Yeah, except for me and my wife who are like Hawkman and Hawkwoman. Okay, so there's um <laughs> but yeah, for most people. <laughs> for most people. So, uh non thanagarians Um so, um, yeah, and so the, the, there's this idea then, and it's everywhere, mm. right? It's ev- everywhere. I'm going, this is who I am. I need to figure out who I am. Uh, I need to reveal who I am. I'm confused about who I am, right? Um, and, or this and, is just who I am, which yeah. is a way of saying I can't and won't repent. Yeah. Um, so th- this has actual consequences, this view, right, of – the person being the soul, the soul already existing and being immortal, and then it just finding itself in a body. Right? Yeah. Um, so there there are consequences of this. When we jettison that view, that platonic view, and get down to, no, the soul is just the life that is in your body, right, that is animating it, Right. Uh, and one of them is, and I know you loved this phrase when I told it to you earlier, uh, if you weren't you, you wouldn't be you. It's very similar to one of my other favorite phrases, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but here's what this means. This, this goes beyond you don't know what it's like to be a bat. This is the next level, everybody. So write this, this down. The next level <laughs> of battiness <laughs> and cosplay is if you weren't you, you wouldn't be you. Um, <laughs> How do you cosplay that? I don't know. We, creativity. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what that means is right. We we sit and we think and we fantasize, right? And and we were like, what if I had been born in 16th century France? Right? right. What if I had been born in, you know, the Roman Empire? What if I had been born, you know, in Pick, right? 19th century Russia, right? Um, we fantasize as we think about it. But but here's here's the sad truth. You're doing the same thing as imagining what it would be like if you were a bat. Yeah. Or as you're assuming. Like Freaky you, Friday. You, yeah, you're assuming that your formed identity would just be sort of taken out of your current self and be deposited in some body in that place and time, which isn't how that works. Right. Human beings are muy permeable. That's why I get for trying to start with a Spanish word. Permeable. <laughs> you know, you're 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 not you're not exclusively a product of your environment or whatever, but you're not not a product of your environment, <laughs> you know? Right. That, so so if, if you, if quote unquote you had been born in 16th century France, that would be a different person. Yeah, and you'd be much more like the other 16th century French people. Yes. That, there is no way in which that person would be you. Mm. There's not. Even if you find a photo of someone from a couple centuries ago that looks like you, that's still not you. It could be time traveling right. you. <laughs> it could be time traveling you from the future. 
It could be that Nicolas Cage is a vampire. But probably, you know, in general cases, it's not you, right? Um, and this means that what we're getting at here is that actually your body is more related to your identity than your soul is. Mm. You have to unpack that one because I'm yes. sure a lot of people are going, <laughs> so, what? what? Yes. <laughs> human souls are more like each other than human bodies are. Yeah, because it's the life of the body. Like the yes. the genitive is, yeah, it goes the one way. It's just way. human life force. Right? It's it's human life that is in your that is in your body. Right? And so this if you want a place where this comes out in uh theological history, right? This becomes really important. This idea of the soul becomes really important in the debates regarding Apollinarianism. Yeah. And, you know, quick review for everybody who hasn't been reading about the early heresies. Apollinarianism was a teaching, and this is the basic version of it, that Christ did not have a human soul. Instead, the logos, the word of God, functioned as the controlling element of his body. Basically. Right. Right. And this was held by ancient people and by certain quasi Christian apologists on the West Coast. Um, see, I don't name people. That's right. <laughs> Some other guy that uses three names all the time. <laughs> um, <all> of that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's weird. Anyway. <laughs> um, Your middle name isn't Duh? Right. Even Duh? Young? Yeah, it's D. It's D. <laughs> My middle name is D. D. Um, so, uh, why, why is that relevant to this? Well, the perspective from which Apollinarians are coming is essentially a sort of platonic view of what a soul is. So for them, if the soul is the self, if the soul is the person, if the soul is the identity, right? And you say that Christ had a human soul. Then for them, you're saying, well, then he was, what, two people? Yeah, right. Right. And aforementioned unnamed person makes a similar kind of argument. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a like a, one uh, analogy. Again, just an analogy, everybody, that seems to work in my mind is, you know, you could have a a, a computer with a, a motherboard, right? And that's this is sort of the concept in some ways of the way we think about human souls and bodies. You know, the motherboard is a thing that's really making the computer go. And if you pull it out, you could put in a different one. It'll function differently. Um, but I think souls are more like batteries. Uh, although you can't just switch them out. So that's where the analogy falls to pieces. Yeah, no, but, it's more like the power itself. Yeah, okay, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's more like the power itself, yeah. The power itself, so yeah. So you can see how why the Apollinarians have a problem with that view of the soul, right? But if you understand that the soul is just the life of the body, right, then... Of course, Christ had a human soul. He had a human yeah. body, and human body. He's alive, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and, yeah. definitionally, he had a human soul. Yeah, and and human bodies are not animated by anything but human souls. Like, there's right. not some other way to do it, uh, which strongly suggests then. I mean, because we can imagine other ways to do it, right? We have these things in our literature. Apollinarianism is, in fact, theologically a zombie jamboree. Yes, a dead man's party. Leave your body at the door. Um, yeah, the so uh, this uh, this decision here regarding Apollinarianism, again, in addition to the idea that the soul is not the identity, right of of the person, right? It's not the self. That it is, it is the life force of the body, right? This also means there's nothing conflicting, right? Because the divine person of the Logos is also not a soul. Mm. Right? A soul is a different thing. He's not an identity or a center of consciousness. Right? The, the Logos, the son, is a divine person. 
who takes upon himself human nature, which includes a human body, a human soul, right? Those, those things. But there is no sort of extra self in there somewhere, <laughs> right? Or uh, the, the divine person of the Logos is not something that could be slotted into a body. Right. 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 Um, so um, in case I haven't made enough people grumpy at me, <laughs> right? Uh, this includes biological sex. I'm sorry. And by that, we mean the state of being male or female. Right. In terms of biological sex. Yes. Which I should point out, by the way, and I don't have my jingle geared up here, but the word sex itself, it's etymologically related to words like sect and section. It means difference. It's, it's difference. Yeah. <laughs> that, that there is no sex that's literally same sex. Is, it means same different. Well, now you're really just trying to get me. Yeah, I'm just putting that out um. there. <laughs> But, Let's put that out. But there. yeah, no, it, it includes it includes what. So if you are an animate human body, right, and if your soul is not some center of the self or some kind of right, like you aren't other than your body. Yeah, you can have feelings and experiences like that, and people do, right? right. But that is not because like there's some kind of mismatch. Right, you can't actually, sorry, Nietzsche, be born out of time. Right, you can't be born in the wrong time. Because if you were in another time, you wouldn't be you, or in or in the wrong, whatever, or in you the wrong body. What, yeah, the, you are right? what you That's, are. Yeah, yeah, because you wouldn't be you. Right, <laughs> right. It would be someone else. Right, and there are other people in the world. I've heard that. Yes, <laughs> who are those I, other people I who you would be know. had you been born where they are? Um, so, um, the the and so that this also means that we, as an as an animate, as a living human body, right? We, in that sense, right, we're an object in the world that other people see and encounter. Right. And interact with. So when someone sees me, like when I walked into the church this evening and a parishioner who I won't name was, was on her way out because she doesn't want to be mentioned on the show. Uh, <laughs> um, when she saw me, she did not see my soul. <laughs> I see your soul, Father Stephen. She did not see my inner identity, my inner self. She did not behold my essence. Right. She saw the living human body in the world that is me. That's what she saw. That's what made various noises and gestures at her that she interpreted as speech. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's what, and that's how we relate to and, and see each other. And this reality, right, that we are living human bodies is uh why relics are a thing see our relics episode yeah because those those pieces are that person yes this is why when the scriptures talk about what we call the intermediate state right yeah. or the the state of the soul after physical death right this is why everything is so vague and nebulous. Yeah, even we've got the and language mysterious. of being hid with Christ. Your life is hid with Christ. Yeah. Or all the language about sleeping. Like we don't we don't the Orthodox Church doesn't teach soul sleep, but that language is certainly all over the place. Yeah. Right. Right. This is why it's so ambiguous and nebulous, right? Because this is a weird and unnatural thing. It's not how we were right. made to be. Right. Human beings were not created to die physically or spiritually. Right. Um, and so it can't be nailed down. If you go with the Platonist view, and this may be one of the things that makes it attractive to folks, right, then that whole thing makes sense. Right. If an orb sort of goes out of my chest like negative man and flies up into the into heaven or goes down into the ground, 
right? And we have this image of, you know, our shadowy self or force ghost or orb or whatever is floating around in one place or another and then returns to our body in the resurrection. I mean, that's still weird, but I mean, it's easier to wrap our head around. Yeah. Right. Whereas the language of scripture, you frankly just, you can't nail it down at all. Which is right. exactly what you would expect if the other is actually what's true. Yeah, I mean, we we use metaphorical language. We talk about the soul taking a journey after death. We use we use that. We talk about the soul going into the underworld, or the soul going in to be with God, or into Abraham's bosom. But ultimately, it's metaphorical language. I mean, there's a, it, it's okay to use it, but we need to understand that it's not ghosts wandering around, you know. Right. There's no ectoplasm being left <laughs> right. in a trail. <laughs> right. We talked about this on the Spirits episode. And, yeah. and, and this is why the bodily resurrection is so concretely important. Yeah. Right. That the um, – for you to be you, <laughs> right, for you to live forever, you have to be back in your body. Mm. Otherwise, it wouldn't be you. Right. Yeah. And 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 so your your identity requires you maintaining your identity requires the bodily resurrection, right? This is ultimately why the the reincarnation dog don't hunt. Yeah, because it's not and it's funny because a lot of the reincarnation doctrines include this idea of losing your memory of who you were before. Right. Which which says that you're not really you. <laughs> you right. know. Right. You're not actually that person. Right. You're functioning as a – you are a different right. person. Like it doesn't – It wouldn't be the same. Yeah. It doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah. It's not, you know, sorry, Indigo Girls. It's not how long till my soul gets it right. Yeah. And you will – this is also why that whole uploading your brain to a computer thing will never work. Oh, man. Actually, no. Thank God. <laughs> right. Because what will happen is you will die and a computer simulation AI with your memories – will have the experience of waking up inside a computer. Usually that's the point where there's some kind of disembodied scream. But that ain't you. You're dead. And all the <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Because, yeah, <laughs> it's not you. Um, so, um, yeah, so a question that might arise that we might anticipate from this. Um, there's a couple. One one might be, you know, wait, are you now are you now turning around over against the whole theme of your show and telling us that that uh, there is no spiritual element of humanity? The answer to that is, of course, no. We already talked about soul spirit. We talked about how go back to the noose episode. How human persons interact with the spiritual world. There is, of course, uh, a spiritual element of man. But another one might be. And this is related that, you know, we keep saying, sorry, Calvinists, uh, but haven't we kind of smuggled in a kind of determinism? Right. If, if the material is the real you, does that mean that you are just the product of a bunch of chemical reactions and such? Yeah. Cause and effect, biological, right. Biological determinism, right. If I had been born in that family, I'd be that person, Right. And that's true at the start. Yes, if you had been born in that family instead of that person, you would be that person, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right? Like if, you know, 47 years ago, I had been born the son of Father Andrew's parents, I would be him. And I wouldn't be That's me. gross. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So throw that out there. <laughs> but, right, that, that would have happened. Right? Like, and I would be a, a different person. But, but, if you've been paying attention to what we've already said, that doesn't mean that I would have done all the things that Father Andrew did. Hmm. Yeah. That doesn't mean I would have made all the same decisions. It doesn't mean I would have made all the same choices. Right? Because part of the fact that my life isn't just the playing out of what I already am is that I'm then free. 
Yeah. Right. And the way, for example, uh, Father Dumitru's Staniloy says this is he talks about this as being one element of of humanity as imaging God, right? Is that just as God is absolute, meaning indetermined, undetermined, right? Free. Um, God is not bound by anything. Sorry, Calvinists, with your justice thing. Um, God is not bound by anything, right? Uh, humans, as imagers of God, according to uh, Father, Father Stanley, are in, in some degree, a lesser degree, a lesser degree, also absolute, able to separate themselves from the material system of, of causation, of cause and effect, and make actual choices. Yeah, and... You know, not to give too much ammunition to that Eugene guy, but um, I mean, this is actually part of Tolkien's anthropology. In oh, um, why though? I know. I mean, what can I say? But I mean, this is something that a lot of people, something a lot of people have read. You know, it's a moderately popular set of books. I guess. Um, I watched uh, the movies once. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> not the Lord Sorry. of the Rings, the Hobbit ones. The Hobbit ones, uh, my favorite. They really should have just called those the dwarves. Because yeah. that's what those movies were about. But um, that is not this podcast. That and um, Forbidden Love. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Man. If I have any goats with me tonight, you have them. No, That was um, the best part of those movies was that relationship. Anyway, go wow. ahead. Wow. <laughs> is that where Triggered. Ant Woman hooks up with the dwarf? Is yeah. that how that – Triggered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, so yeah, be Tolkien, Tolkien like the one the thing that distinguished one of the big things that distinguished humans from elves in his world is that um you know there's there's the music which is sort of the blueprint for creation from the very beginning and um humans have the ability to go outside the music. Like they can do stuff that's unexpected even to the Valar who are sort of the angelic beings in Tolkien's world whereas elves can't do that. Um, and it's it's why humans have this sort of redemptive capability that no one else does. It's interesting how deeply Christian all that stuff is. How about that? Um, but but yeah, it's 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 interesting. That, you know that that I mean he he messes around a lot with the whole idea of fate and free will. Um, and one of the constants in it is that humans, even though they're not omnipotent, you know they're not <laughs> they're not universally capable. Um, they do have free will. They can actually do unexpected things, things that are unexpected, not to God, but to pretty much everything else in the whole creation. So, yeah. And that's true. <laughs> that's for real. So, all right. Well, we're going to go ahead and take our first break, and we'll be back in a moment with the second half of The Lord of Spirits. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of The Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. What is the spiritual significance of almsgiving? In the new booklet, Spiritual Transformation and Giving, Bishop Alexi of Sitka and Alaska draws from a wealth of patristic and modern sources to explore why God commands us to give. What motivates people to give or hold back? What spirit should characterize our giving? And the result of spiritual transformation that occurs in our heart when we give. Find spiritual transformation and giving at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome back. Give us a ring at 855-AF-RADIO. Uh, you know, with all this this who question where we keep asking, um, n there's two things I wanted to mention. Number one, I once, uh, when I'm, during my stagehand days, I actually worked a The Who concert. So I think it was like 1997 maybe which is before some of y'all were even born. Um, and uh, although their, their drummer was Zach Starkey, the son of Ringo Starr. 
The other thing I want to mention is that the very first line in Hamlet, since I already mentioned Shakespeare, the very first line in Hamlet is, who's there? Who's there? And when I took a Hamlet course as an undergrad, we spent three and a half weeks on who's there, which every time I say that in the presence of my wife, she'll be like, oh. But it was one of the best three and a half weeks that I've ever had in, in my educational experience. So I'm just throwing that out there for all the English lit nerds. <laughs> who's there? You don't have anything to say to that, Father? Or maybe he stepped out. It's all mine. Here we are, Lord of Spirits, just Father Andrew Stephen Damick. No Father Stephen DeYoung. What could happen? We don't know. All kinds of things that could happen. So Things are happening. Yes. <laughs> He's back. I was ad-libbing. You didn't hear the brilliance okay. that I just threw out at everybody. Yeah. Need to run longer commercials. <laughs> I know. We'll have a talk with Trudy with, about that. Happy birthday, Trudy. Yeah, there's going to be something we can advertise, for Pete's sake. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was just mentioning I once spent three and a half weeks studying uh, the first line of Hamlet, which is who's there. Very, very relevant to all these questions we've been asking about who and the who. So was that a stunt? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. Talking Shakespeare? No. See, that's that's the other thing. That's the other thing. One of the other things I'm nerdy about that people actually don't generally know if they listen to my podcast that I'm I'm a super big Shakespeare fan. So. Yes, something rotten in Denmark. The <laughs> podcast from Ancient Faith Ministries. Amen. <laughs> the poisoned chalice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you ever get tired of that Roland guy, just it's an idea. Show him aside and go Shakespeare. That's right. No more medieval. We're doing Renaissance now, boys. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back. Anyway, it's the second half. Uh, we just got through doing a whole 48 minutes of sorry, Calvinists, sorry, Plato, sorry, Origin. Sorry, mostly mesmerists. Plato. Yeah, mostly, mostly Plato. Plato. Yeah. A little bit more Plato brain. Idealism is lame. <laughs> Flee Plato brain. Yeah. Plato, that some kind of but... wide eyed idealist or. He's an idealist in the truest sense. The original. I have an idea of Plato. Yes, um, maybe he's still the best. <laughs> this is one of those parts where we're just like riffing and there are people out there like typing angry reviews <laughs> and comments about. This show could be 50% shorter if you cut out all the giggling, all of these things. Yes. Right. All the nonsense. All the nonsense. And then other people will reply and say, but we're here for the nonsense. We love the nonsense. We're here for it. Yeah. So, okay. But well, enough now nonsense. we're actually Now we're actually moving into, we're getting closer now to our this topic. Sense. Oh, to our topic. Yeah. A little bit closer. Yeah. Healing. <laughs> so, Healing. yes. Our second half. Mm. Right. So, um, we've talked now about what a human person is. Now we're going to get into what it means for a human person to find healing. And so, of course, the concept of healing is found throughout the scriptures. Um, yeah, kind of everywhere. <laughs> that's, but there are, I think, two significant phases that we can identify in terms of how healing is talked about in the scriptures. One being an early phase uh, in ancient Israel the other coming later in Israelite history and then flowing into the New Testament. Mm. And uh, this is not a change in the sense that there was sort of one view and that was abandoned in place of another view. No, it's just a question of perspective. Uh, right. Uh, looking right. at the same, you know, like one is kind of from 50,000 feet and the other is kind of zoomed in. Right. And keeping both, as we're going to see when we get to the end of this half, I make a promise to you, dear listener. Uh, keeping them both together is going to be important, yeah. right? The way that the two connect to each other is going to be important. Uh, so we'll start with that sort of first phase, the ancient Israelite phase. And we're starting in the Torah, really, with this phase. And the way in which illness, sickness, right, uh, ill health, um, lack of health is talked about in this early phase is in terms of plague. Yeah. So and mass, 
bad health. Yes. So wa- waves of pestilence or plague coming upon populations and spreading. Um, and one of the earliest places we see that is actually in the form of a sign that's given to Moses uh, by God before he is sent to speak to Pharaoh to demand that Pharaoh let the Israelites go. Yeah, this is one of the weirdest. <laughs> it's a weird, <laughs> weird thing. Uh, so we don't have to talk about the staff turning into a snake and eating the other snakes because everybody listened to the Battle Wizards episode. That was a cool episode. And so they know that that was a traditional ancient Near Eastern wizard duel. Uh, but um, the other sign that Moses is given, where he puts his hand into his coat and pulls it out and it's leprous, right? It's infected with a plague. And then he puts it back in the coat and pulls it out and it's healed. Uh, and so what is this one about, <laughs> right? Why, right? Why? I mean, it's a cool trick, but I mean, yeah, that's yeah. not why God gives signs. <laughs> right? No, right. Yeah, like if you're going to come up with some spectacular thing to show you're a powerful sorcerer, like this is not the one that <laughs> right. you would yeah. pick. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, he, he didn't have Moses go and pull a quarter out from behind Pharaoh's ear, right? Like this isn't just <laughs> tricks, right? right. Um, this is This is to show not just the power of God, but uh, something specific about the power of God. Because, of course... The purpose of these signs, even though God not only knew they weren't going to work, but told Moses they weren't going to work <laughs> before he went and did them for Pharaoh. Um, Urging. Yeah. <laughs> Here, you're it's gonna not going to work, this. Moses, but... It's not it. going to work, but go do it. Um, is that Pharaoh had no reason to respect the God of a bunch of slaves. Right, because not only <laughs> out of like his pride or whatever, but also like think about this. If you remember the spirit ideas, they're a bunch of slaves. So how great can their controlling spirit really be? Right. Like if so, this is the best he can do for them. In Pharaoh's mind, right? Mine are clearly better because I have enslaved you. <laughs> right? right. My gods like, empower me and your gods your god is really not great. Right. Yeah. And so this is showing the power of God, but showing a specific power of God that God has control over plague. Right, which right. is God has control over plague. You know, and so plagues, of course, plague the ancient world. Yes, <laughs> and that's tough. There was a the plague mean, of plagues. It, yeah, I mean, just it's 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 uncontrollable. It's you know, everybody yeah. feels helpless. It's the worst. It's really really bad. I mean, we we all know what that's like. Right, now. and this was well through history. Right. Yeah. I mean, we had a pandemic, but and I know a lot of people died. But sorry, folks, compared to like the Black Plague. Yeah, where it's like COVID was third, not the Black Plague. One third, I think, of the population dies in the Black of Europe. Plague yeah, of Europe. Yeah, uh, that's a lot. Right. And so, what is this? What is this vision then of what disease, what ill health, what plague, what pestilence is? Well, it's this force out there in the world. Hmm. There's this force that's out there active in the world that can come and visit destruction upon you. Or that maybe there might be some way to ward it off. To either stop a plague once it starts or to ward it off and keep plague from befalling you and go befall someone else instead. Oh, right. And this force out there in the world had a name in the ancient Near East. Uh, this demonic force of pestilence was called Reshef, or some very close variation with those consonants, <laughs> right, in the ancient world. And when I say in the ancient Near East, in the ancient world, I mean pretty much everywhere and over a long period of time. Yeah, a long period of time. <laughs> so the the earliest inscriptions we have about Reshef are in Syria and from the 3rd millennium B.C., so the 2000s B.C. Right, so that's 4,000 years ago. Yes, roughly. Probably more like 4,500, frankly. <laughs> Four and a half thousand. Yeah, <laughs> about 4,500 years ago. Um, and then we have mentions in Ugarit, in Syria, in Anatolia, meaning Turkey, like the Hittites, uh, in south-central, what's now Turkey, uh, Egypt, the Egyptians assimilate Reshef, which is very rare for them to assimilate a Semitic god uh, mm. from outside. 
um, uh, the Carthaginians um, have uh, Rashi. We'll talk about a little detail about that in a minute. All the way up to Cicero in the first century BC mentions the Phoenician Apollo, who he calls Apollo Arsippus. And if you look at the consonants of Arsippus, it's Reshef. Right. You got the R, the sh, 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 and the <laughs> Right. And there are depictions of Apollo that match depictions of Reshef. Yeah. So we're talking basically 2,500, 3,000-ish years of belief in this demonic presence. Right. Uh, which, I mean, again, plagues are a big deal, a big, big deal in the ancient world. They, they yeah. rock everybody's world uh, and, in a really and awful way. To give you an idea of how prominent he was throughout this period, there's a treaty between Philip of Macedon, who you might know as Alexander the Great's dad, and Hannibal of Carthage, the elephant guy, in the 4th century BC. Uh, and in that, one of the gods invoked from the Carthaginian side is Reshef. That's not nice. <laughs> it, well, and it's a, it's a way of, right, the idea is if I violate these this treaty, may yeah. plague, right, a fall cur- upon Yeah, us, a, right? a curse, yeah, like a yeah. big curse come upon me, yeah. Right, because these these treaties, these covenants have blessings and curses, right? Yeah. Um, kind of like Deuteronomy. Um, so how is Reshef depicted? Reshef is always depicted as an archer. Mm. This is common across all these cultures. And he has these arrows that are often depicted as kind of fiery burning arrows, but the burning is aimed at the idea of infection, right? Someone who has an infection has runs a fever. Yeah, right, right. Their body becomes hot. And so the image of Reshef as this force behind plague is that he he comes to an area, he launches his arrows, you know, into the population. They hit indiscriminately, right, the way the plague does. And strike people down, right? Uh, so when we say he's worshipped and stuff, right, He's invoked as a curse there, and the worship is more sort of the warding off, right? We keep him happy, we ward him off, we keep him at a distance, maybe try to get him to go after our enemies if it'll help us, right? Um, and so there, there are a lot of places in the Old Testament and the scriptures as a whole where this imagery shows up, and we're not going to go through all of them. We've, we went through a little bit of Reshef stuff in another previous episode. Um, and I know we talked about at least the Job passage that we're not going to talk about tonight there, but we're going to talk about a few passages that either directly mention Reshef or allude to him in the Old Testament to make a particular point. Yeah. Right? And, you about, know, p- yeah. part of the reality, of course, is that as we're all reading translations of the Bible, we're n- often what happens is these names get translated according to what the the name means. Like it would be like, for instance, if, you know, if you're translating the New Testament, you come across the apostle I'm named after instead of saying, you know, and Andrew brought, you know, the, the boy with the five loaves and the two fish. It says, and the manly one <laughs> brought, you know, like that, that would be what's, what's going on there. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's deliberate in a lot of cases. Uh, yeah. Modern right. translations. It's trying right. to demythologize the text. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. admittedly. These names mean this thing that the god is associated with, but the, like there's a reason for that, you know. It's yeah. it's all kind of bound up as one one image, you know. So yeah, so uh, the first example is Deuteronomy chapter thirty two, verses twenty three and twenty four. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by Reshef and Ketev. I will send the teeth of beasts against them with the venom of things that crawl in the dust. And Reshef there, like if you were looking at the ESV, it'll say he's devoured by plague. And then Ketev, poisonous pestilence. Yeah. So that's why you don't see Reshef and 
cat dev probably if you pull your Bible off the shelf and look at Deuteronomy 32. Depending. But yeah. yeah, I mean, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> but but we, we should also mention here Ketev and there's also a Deber who are other Deber. sort of demonic forces associated with disease and pestilence yeah. who yeah. get paired a lot, as you'll see in some of these with, with Reshef. Yeah. Yeah. So there's another one, Psalm 78, 48. And this is, this is the Psalm. So this is much later after this happens, but it's talking about the plague sent on Egypt. He gave over their cattle to the hail and their flocks to Reshefs, which, so in the ESV that gets translated as thunderbolts. So a little bit less of a literal translation. Um, but again, it's like that God threw Reshefs at them. <laughs> Right, their, yeah, their flags on Egypt, right? God yeah. is kind of unleashing these these forces on them. Yep, yep. Okay, so another one is Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Habakkuk being everyone's favorite book of the Bible. <laughs> of a cum, as it were. There's there's cool stuff in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Under, under red. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so verse 3, God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went Deber, and Reshef followed at his heels. We just heard verses 3 and 4 a bunch of times in church, by the way. And I'm paying, paying close attention. But um, but notice in in the last verse, in verse 5, Right, so it's talking about sort of God in His Majesty, like processing, right? And before Him goes Deber, after Him is Reshef. So they're like pets He has on a leash, <laughs> right? Mm. Right, they're forces that are under His under His control, and this I'm, is I'm yeah. saying we saw that kind of thing before with Leviathan, the idea that you know Leviathan is. Even de- despite being this primordial, massive underwater sea serpent, is also like his cat that he sort of plays with, right? Yeah. Right, and and so in these quotes, you see that it's not denying that this force exists out in the world, right? But it's placing this force under the control of Yahweh, the God of Israel, right. That's and the whole this, hand in the coat thing. Yeah. And as we've said before on the show, this is a major element of theodicy in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, is that God is in control of these things, even these things which are evils, and he uses them to his ends to bring good out of them. Hmm. Yeah. And so since he has control of them... You can have an exorcism prayer like Psalm 91 or 90 in the uh, Greek numbering, which was yeah. is the first of the Davidic exorcism prayers found at Qumran, is also in the, in the book of Psalms in our Bibles. Yeah. Well, and, and isn't that verse, isn't that Psalm used in the Orthodox funeral service as well? Yes. He that dwelleth under the shadow of the Almighty shall, see, I'm, I'm blanking now suddenly on it, but... Um, so abide in the shelter of the God, the God of, heaven, of heaven. Yeah, I yeah. Think is yeah, yeah. Our English translation. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So uh, Psalm 91 5 or 95, if you're looking at the, the Greek version, you will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. And it's not, nor the reshef that flies by day. It does say arrow there, literally, but it's a reference to that. Reshef, right. the, the bowman. And if you go into the next verses, you get Deber, you get these other. People who hang around with him all the time, and the other things we've yeah. we've read, yeah. um, and then probably the last time, not probably the last time that we see Reshef sort of in person, as it were, <laughs> in, in the Bible, is in the Book of Revelation, in which he is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah, we have to do a whole episode on that, I think, at some point. Um, yeah, so Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, this is where you get the horseman, includes this line, And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Right, so note the bow, and this yep. is the horseman who's generally called pestilence. 
pestilence. Right. You have war, famine, pestilence, and death, right, as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is pestilence. How is he getting identified as pestilence? There's nothing about disease there. It's the bow. The bow, yeah. And Reshef, right? And so this last image of the horseman riding out as the seals are broken is of God in judgment essentially unleashing everything, Mm. letting it go. And the character that that gives to God's sort of final judgment at the end is that it's not that God goes and does these horrible, brutal things to people. It's that God stops protecting them. There's been this period of time. This is another piece of biblical theodicy. There's been this period of time where God has been protecting people and preserving people to give them time to repent. But eventually that time for repentance comes to an end. And he lets things go. Right. And they go to their, to their end. Right. Um, so it is in the, the context of the removal of protection, not God inflicting harm or violence. Right. Right. God's not throwing the arrows himself. He's right. letting this, letting this force go. Yeah. And why is this force in the world? Because of human sin. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's sort of this first stage where plague, disease, ill health, this is a force, a kind of with a name, right? It's a force. It's a demonic force in, in the world. Then as we transition into the latter era, frankly, to the period of exile and afterward, uh, and start moving toward the second temple period, we get, start getting examples already in the Old Testament, specifically with the prophets Elijah and Elisha, uh, of sort of what we would think of as more traditional healings. Yeah, so it kind of zooms in now on individual people in yes. many cases. being yeah. healed by other individual people. Yeah. I <laughs> well, mean, by I God think... through other individual people. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Elijah and Elisha, the big things about them are, you know, raising people from the dead. Um, that's huge. <laughs> that's, you know, we're used to reading the Bible. We might think, oh, yeah, a lot of people get raised from the dead. But no, that's huge. Someone comes back. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So there's the, the raising of the widow's son, raising of the Shunammite woman's son by Elisha. So Elijah does it, then Elisha does it, right? Um, and then, uh, there's the healing of Naaman, the leper by Elisha. Yeah. Go dip, dip yourself in the muddy Jordan river. He complains, no. aren't there much nicer rivers? Just dip yourself in the river, dude. It's Syria. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, right. But so he's healed of his leprosy, right? So this is God healing a person through the prayers, the intercession, right? Through another person. Um, And in these cases, right, so like the leprosy that's afflicting Naaman is not personalized, right? There's not sort of an exorcism that's done, Hmm. right? And dipping yourself in the Jordan does not have the character of an exorcism. No. It has the character of cleansing or purification, right? Even though it wasn't up to his standards in terms of water purity. Um, (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. And there's not sort of – there's no mention – Right, like there is, say, in Tobit, right? There's no mention that that the widow's son or the Shunammite son, right, that some demon was involved somewhere, right? Um, Right, they're just sort of subject to these kinds of effects that are in the world. Right, right. And so this is really, this, this kind of healing is dealing with the effects of illness, disease, death, decay, pestilence on the body of a person, right, on the person. Right. So to make a comparison, right, you look at, for example, we've talked a couple times on the show about Korah's rebellion, right? When Korah, you know, stood up against Aaron and his family who had been designated as high priests, Korah and his family were other Levites. They said, hey, aren't all the Israelites holy? Aren't we all priests? You know, why are you putting on airs, right? Um, 
And not only does the ground swallow him up, but this plague breaks out in the camp. Right? There's this outbreak of plague. People start dying. They go and the, the priests go and Aaron goes and they take their censers and they go and stand between the living and the dead. And the plague is stopped. Right? That's very clearly a depiction of plague as this evil spiritual force, this demonic force. Yeah. Right. That needs to be stopped by priestly action. Right. That's very different. <laughs> right. Again, than what we see here with the healing of the person. Right. And there's a direct parallel here to the way the Bible talks about sin. Right. Especially the way, say, St. Paul talks about sin. As we've said many times on the show, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, when St. Paul talks about sin, it's in the singular. He talks about sin, not sins. Right. right? When he's talking about particular acts, he usually calls them transgressions or iniquities or just translated in different ways. Right. But he's referring to acts. But when he talks about sin, so that sin is this force in the world, the way sin was crouching at Cain's door. Right. There's this force of sin that's at large in the world that needs to be wrestled with and struggled with. It's trying to master you. You must master it. Right. At the same time, right, the scriptures do talk about, and even St. Paul sometimes talk about, sins. The individual actions com com committed by people and their consequences on those people, on their relationships with other people. Right. Um, those are, um, those both exist in terms of sin. And those both exist in terms of sickness, right? In terms of disease, in terms of ailments, right? There is this demonic force out there of plague, of pestilence, of disease, right? That is out there in the world, right? That has to be, be put off, that we, we, we pray to God in priestly action. There are prayers, right? And then there is the actual healing that has to happen with the individual person from the consequences of that. Right. And so the fact that these are so conceptually parallel, right. When we get to the gospels and we get to Christ's healings, of course, all the people Christ heals, there's too many to list, right. Even as long as we run this program, we could not run through every person Christ heals, uh, and not be here for at least until tomorrow. Um, but, right, one thing that you can notice, at least on several occasions, like Luke 5, 17 through 26, Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8, Mark 2, verses 1 through 12, right, um, which all happen to be the healings of paralyzed people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one thing uh, that you can notice is that Christ in his healings in those cases, explicitly connects the forgiveness of sins to the healing he's doing. Yeah. Let your sins be forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. Right. That these are, these are directly connected. So sin and disease are really paralleled in their biblical conceptions. Right. Sin is talked about like disease. Disease is talked about like sin, right? They're talked about... In these parallel ways, right? So then, once again, questions potentially arise. Are yes. we faith healers? Just Speaking it, for myself, it. no. Positively Father. confess <laughs> your healing, <laughs> Father Stephen. <laughs> See, my, my friend Michael Landsman has taught me how to speak this way. <laughs> uh, he's a bad influence. Um, so, right. So I at least am not a faith healer. I will let Father Andrew answer for himself. I know I'm not. Uh, <laughs> um, but so why? Right. And, and what, what do we mean by faith healer? We're not just using that as a pejorative, right? Or no, talk about no, and, and, certain yeah. grifters of the 1990s. Uh, and, we, and, and we also, we also right. are not, in this case, referring to like saints who, well, we're going to address this, but who like right. heal people through prayer. Right. You know, right. that's not what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about the phenomenon in, what would you say, primarily in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, though not entirely, but primarily. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, really. and especially kind of the word faith Pentecostalism, particularly. Yeah, 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 and that's not, and that's not limited to Protestantism, right? There are other groups. There are groups within Roman Catholicism. There are other groups that that are in that Pentecostal charismatic mold. Um, yep, and plenty of Protestants who aren't, right? <laughs> but um, so that idea that you can sort of claim healing. Right. Or that that if your belief, if your faith is strong enough, you will be healed. Yeah. Believe right. harder and boom. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's even this kind of thing exists outside of Christianity, right? Like the secret and all that stuff, right? Like um, where that's taken to a weird pagan place, right? Of sort of visualizing and declaring reality, right? Um, so... Well, wait, if we're saying that sin and uh, illness are are so similar and so parallel, why don't you do that? Well, you can't do that with sins either. Right. You can't just, I declare myself forgiven. Yes. I claim this forgiveness. Because, I declare victory over this temptation. Yeah, which, I mean, people try do. It, but, yeah, right. People yeah. say that stuff, but the truth is, is that repentance takes work. Yeah. And you have about Actually, the same track record, I imagine, of... <laughs> Declaring victory over addiction and declaring someone healed. Right. Probably about the same success rate. Yeah. You actually got to yeah. work at it. You got to be reformed. And I'm not saying you have to be reformed. <laughs> You've got to be reformed. Formed again. Formed again. That's right. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So receiving forgiveness, right, is it just like a declaration? It requires repentance. It requires work, right? See our recent repentance episode, right? It requires, there are things you have to do, right? And in the same way, health, there are things you have to do. That's right? the way it normally works. Yes. <laughs> That's, you, can't, you can't just declare yourself healthy. You can't just declare yourself forgiven. You yeah. can't. I mean, I've never seen anyone just, declare, declare yeah. weight loss. That would be a trick. I do that every morning. You can, see my out track for you. you can see my track record. Um, <laughs> right. So, right. But also, also, you can't just pray for it. Right. right? So we would say, right, that if, if you're diagnosed with something or if you have a condition or there's a health problem, right, and – you don't seek any kind of medical intervention. You just pray about it, right? That is exactly as problematic as I have sinned against someone and all I do is pray by myself about it. Yeah. Like if I steal your car. Yeah. God, please forgive me. I'm going to keep the car, yeah. but God, yeah. please forgive me. <laughs> don't return the car. Don't apologize. Don't try to <laughs> right. me. just, you know, just pray about it and feel better, right? Um, again, that's not how either of those work, right? So then, right, why do we pray? Well, we're going to get more into that. Why do we pray for healing, right? Because saying don't just do it doesn't mean don't do it at all, right? <laughs> that's Right. Um, but that's because God works through means. Yeah. Right? God heals a lot of people through medications and through doctors, Right, because ultimately he provided all that stuff. He provided, you know, the, the doctor's ability to gain that knowledge. He provided the raw material. Like he provided, you know, everything. Yes, and he forgives in the sense of healing and restoring a lot of sin, right, through kind words, shared meals. Yeah. And right. even repentance is described as being a gift from God. It doesn't mean he zaps you and says, bam, now you're repenting. It's, okay, here's how you repent. Here's all the means you need, and it's going to work yes. because I'm giving this to you, yes. but you got to use it. Yes. So it's not something you're entitled, forgiveness is not something you're entitled to that you can claim, and bodily health is not something you're entitled to that you can claim. Sorry, word faith preachers. Folk at all. Exactly. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and take our second break for this episode on unction here on the Lord of Spirits, and we'll be right back.
Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Ancient Faith Publishing is pleased to announce a new release that is part history, part theology, and part devotional. The Story of Jesus, A History and Theology of Christ, explores the complete life and teachings of our Lord, from before His conception in Mary's womb until His ascension. Revered 20th century Egyptian elder and scholar Matthew the Poor wrote many volumes on the subject of Christ's significance, life, and teachings, which translator James Helmy has distilled into one highly readable book that will make a valuable addition to every Christian's library. The Story of Jesus is now available in paperback and ebook at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. You know, I'm wondering if this has the most sorry whoever's of any episode of Lord of Spirits. I mean, you do throw a lot of sorries in Whole Council of God. Yes. This is, this is, I think, the apology episode, really. <laughs> or the most Canadian episode. One of the two. <laughs> That's, you know, sorry Calvinists. So, yeah, so, yeah. So you might mean Exodus is, yeah. is not good. Yeah. But. Well, now we've alienated them. Um, <laughs> sorry Canadians. Yeah. I, I do have to say, with that commercial, that sounds like a wonderful book. I have not read it yet. So I'm, I, I'm not being critical of the book. But my issue with the commercial is that anytime I hear part blank, part blank, my brain fills in all cop. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I never, never thought that I would hear the confluence of RoboCop with an Egyptian. Yes, like anything. Elder. <laughs> anything. Part German Shepherd, part Poodle, all cop. All right? cop. Like it doesn't matter. That's where my brain goes. Nice. So it's just a wording thing. Understood. Well... I'll I'll send that note to our marketing yes. department. <laughs> pass pass that on for me, yeah. if you would. <laughs> well, they all listen to the show, so you know. Yes, they love my advice. I know, <laughs> and heed the... every last syllable yes. of it. Yes. Yeah. So, all right. Well, for those of you who have your generic Lord of Spirits episode scripts out, you know that the third half is always the one where we begin talking about the thing that the show is actually about. And I also think, because I, I knew I had to throw this out there, if anyone ever creates the Lord of Spirits wiki, Lord of Spirits wiki, that probably the generic show outline is going to be one of the articles. So It should be. It should be. It should be. It can, I mean, think of the amount of material that's there. Right. Just like song references. Exactly. Exactly. In jokes. I mean, there could be all kinds of wiki pages out there, people. Yes. So, you know, just saying. I think most, that out there. Of, most of our audience, though, are people with long commutes. <laughs> that's true. They're not going to be Don't typing while they led themselves to wiki editing. I think that's, that's the flaw in the, the well, grand design. Well, although once we have self-driving cars, watch that. There we go. There's going to be a proliferation of wikis. There we go. I have a Wikim, person with a self-driving car, but it's scary. Oh, neat. <laughs> eh, it's kind of scary. <laughs> well, we're testing here's it the out. Thing you're not, a... here's, here's the thing you're not thinking about. So the self-driving cars have an ethical algorithm. Yes, right. Right? To What to do? You know, pedestrian jumps out. What do you do? Yeah, do you save the pedestrian or do you save the driver? There are a certain set of scenarios in which your car will choose to kill you rather than someone else or someone else's. Yeah. So before you buy a self-driving car, be aware of that. It will go Duly hell noted. 9 thousand on you, <laughs> given the right well, circumstances. You know, most of us are not going to buy self-driving cars. Most of us are just going to order them on our apps. They'll just yes. show up at your house, pick you up, take you where you want to go. My my strategy is to drive like a 25-year-old car. And, and instead of replacing the car, you just replace one part at a time. Oh, the car of Theseus. It, yes, it's it's the Johnny Cash method of nice. uh, 
new car purchase. I thought about Johnny Cash earlier when I was reading that bit from the apocalypse. Because I always, whenever I read the book of Revelation, I hear it in the voice of Johnny Cash. Yeah. Well, you can hear him read it on YouTube. Yes, I know. I know. This all is right. that banter again that all the people <laughs> Just cut this part Some out, do, everybody. but not all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Skip this part of the transcript. Skip, skip, skip. So, okay. Well, uh, now we're actually going to talk about the sacrament <laughs> per se. But, of course, yes. all the stuff we talked about goes into this. You can't just right. listen to the third half. There's, there's, yeah. So, yeah, so, so you know, kind of uh, ground zero, as it were, of scriptural references for this is... Yes, the when someone asks object. you, Holy Unction, where's that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? It's literally explicitly commanded in the Bible. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know why a lot of people don't do this. Um, we do it. So James chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the presbyters of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So note that connection between forgiveness of sins and healing of sickness. Yes. It's right there together in yeah. one sacrament. They're right there. And so this is why we had to go through that other stuff before we got here, right? How are they right. connected? Um, and so why is this a sacrament or why is this a mystery of the church? Well, like the others, this is God working through created material means, right? Yeah, it's so, oil and it's presbyters and their hands and their prayer. And, and at one point it's the Bible. God who does it. God will raise them up. Right. God doing it through, right? Just like as we saw, right, with with uh, baptism, you've got water. Chrismation, you've got your own, you've got myrrh oil, right? Uh, marriage, you have uh, a man and a woman, <laughs> right? You have these material that are, right, how the, the mystery works. And here you have oil, right? Yep. God working through the oil. And for folks who aren't Orthodox or maybe haven't been to an unction service, because not all Orthodox churches do this regularly. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Several of the details in here are followed in the way we do it in the Orthodox church. Like you'll know that it says presbyters, plural. Ideally, uh, the unction service is served by seven presbyters, seven priests. Yeah, and the way that gets one of the ways it gets expressed within the service is that there's seven gospels and traditionally seven anointings. Yeah, uh, although the way that it's usually done with with lots of people at once is one anointing at the end. But yeah, 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 and so the the people are prayed over as it says, and there is actually at one point where they are blessed with the gospel book. Yeah, the Bible itself, and the prayer speaks of. God's healing hand, which is present in that gospel. Uh, yeah, very powerful. Uh, so to give you sort of more of an idea, right, of how we do it. And that's that's what we do the big service. Oil from that service is also kept. And so the, you know, in situations where someone's in the hospital, someone's sick, right, the, the, the presbyter, the priest can go and anoint them. Right, you don't need to gather up seven, uh, seven priests and do the whole service every time someone yeah. needs to be anointed. That's yeah. usually done when you're doing it for the whole right congregation, the whole right. I mean, community. that's theoretically the ideal is that yeah. you would do that whole thing every time, but it's just it's it's not it's not generally practical. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. 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 Um. So um, here again, as Father Andrew mentioned, you see the forgiveness of sins and healing sort of inextricably linked together, right? And even though they're linked, and we talked about in the last half how we see that in Christ's healings, how they're linked, and we talked a little bit about how they're related in being parallel to each other. There are still a lot of ways in which those two dots get connected that are really bad, 
<laughs> That's, um, and the reason I say they're really bad is not just, oh, that is incorrect theology. You use the incorrect preposition. You are a heretic, <laughs> sir, on the internet, right? <laughs> um, they, they're, they're wrong and they're bad because of the consequences they have for people. Yeah. And especially in this area of healing and the idea of miraculous healing, people have done horrible harm and damage. Oh, yeah. By misunderstanding yeah. this. Yeah. Literally, people have died without medical treatment because of these wrong theological understandings. Right. So, or, or, or had their faith destroyed, you know, yes. their faith in Christ because, like, well, you just, your faith is too weak and that's why you're still suffering, you know? Yes. Yeah, so people have been yeah. victimized in any number of ways by these. That's why we're saying these are really bad, right? Yeah. So the first of those, you know, the book of Job being exhibit A, is that there's a causative relationship between sin and suffering or illness, right? Yeah, you did something bad, and so therefore you are sick or suffering. Right. You've got this sin your in punishment. your life. Yes. yes, you're being punished. God is smacking you down because of the bad thing you did. Yes, and and – Relatively few, not no one, unfortunately, but relatively few people would say it that explicitly. But a lot of people think it, right? It's it's in there at a certain level, right? Yeah. Why is that person or that family suffering so much? Oh, they yeah. must be bad. <laughs> must be something going on. There must be something wrong, right? Um, another really bad one is that sin or illness or, hey, the world – is kind of illusory. It isn't real. And this is sorry, Mary Baker Eddy for the first time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Boom. In, this, in almost three years of podcasting together, <laughs> finally get to say sorry, Mary Baker Eddy. Yes. I don't know if we have any Christian science people that listen to this show, but if we do, I, I want to hear from you. I, I just yeah. want to know that you're out there and say, welcome. For science and health with key to the scriptures, I say the nay. Yeah. Oh, and my favorite. Okay. So I just have to throw this out there. For those of you who have not read a certain little book called Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, um, one good. of my favorite <laughs> – there's a series of sermons, sermon lessons that they read um, from Mary Baker Eddy's stuff. And one of them is called something like, is the world and everything in it the, the result of atomic force? I think that's what it is. But, I mean, it's this idea, right, that, that, that everything is just – the function of mind, you yes. know, so sickness is because you're thinking bad. Yes. Right. Which is what sin is within that system. Yeah. Right. It's sort right. of this, this delusion. And it's sort of, if you look at her influences, man, I'm really trashing the Christian scientists. I was much nicer to the Mormons. Um, <laughs> but if you look at her influences, it's a bunch of half rate quasi Hindu grifters. Um, in the early 20th century, sort of people who set themselves up as quote unquote swamis and stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, that whole, that whole sort of new thought movement is, I'm sorry, it's really wacky. Um, it's actually, you know, it's interesting. You can trace it down into the mid 20th century word faith, faith healers. Like there's this, there's this line that you can trace pretty easily between that movement in the 19th century and then this other stuff. So. Yeah. And again, the reason I'm going harder on this is how destructive it is. You're right. People refusing to give their children medical care. Right. Right. This is this is serious stuff at this point. Yeah. Right. Faith yeah. harder and everything will be yeah. fine. This is this isn't just like, you know, you added the filioque to the creed, right? Which is bad <laughs> enough. Sorry, Roman Catholic friends. But <laughs> who right, else this do is, we not apologize to in this episode? This is a whole <laughs> I didn't this think they would be the one. Level. <laughs> it's a whole other level of destructiveness, right? You thought this would be an innoc um, innocuous, unctuous episode. But yes, not. yes. It has not been so unctuous after all. <laughs> Do you uh, know? Uh, but, yes, yeah. So that sense that the world and, of course, sickness yeah. is illusory, that's kind of the second in our rogues gallery yeah. of, uh, of errors as, in as, regards as, to the relationship. As, as my father once pointed out to me, uh, he had never been inside a Christian science reading room where everyone wasn't wearing glasses. Huh. So take that as you will. Um, huh. <laughs> that's, um, that one for later. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's, so, but probably the most common one, right? 
because I don't know that we had any Christian scientists or church of religious science folks for me to run off just now. Um, and as I said, not a lot of people would verbalize that, oh, yes, if you get sick, it's because of because you sinned, right? They wouldn't at least verbalize it that way. Yeah. This this third one is held by just about everybody who's an American. And and <laughs> usually unconsciously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, often and, consciously, but usually unconsciously. Yeah. And that's that there are these partitioned sort of separate spheres. There's sort of physical health, right, which is this science-based thing, right, of biochemistry and et cetera, et cetera. There's mental health. And there may be which, crossover between these things. Right. Which, Well, there's, there's mental health, which may also be reducible to biochemistry or may not, depending on your point of view. Yeah. But that's a separate thing. Yep. And then there's spiritual health or issues of sin, which are this third separate other thing. And that ultimately they don't connect. And in a lot of cases, this is a, a reaction to especially the first bad view. Yeah. Right. So they would don't want to say they're horrified by someone saying, oh, you got sick because you sinned. And so they say, look, no, sin and physical health have nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Look, it's just an, right. an illness. You know, this is not your fault. Uh, right. All, and all that sin, kind of stuff. Sin is this legal thing of sin and forgiveness. Mental health is this other thing that we address through psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, right? Um, and then physical health is this this sort of other thing, right? Um, and so uh, the problem with this is even though a lot of people, if not most Americans, when asked will say, yes, these are these separate spheres, functionally, we all know that they overlap all the time. Yeah, because you're having one kind of experience. Yes. All at once. You yes. know, the, the wretchedness that you feel in the midst of having COVID for the eighth time or whatever uh, <laughs> is not you, – you, you can't just say, well, my body's kind of feeling like crap, but I'm good. Like you might yeah. say that to yourself, but that is not how you feel. That's not yeah. how you really are being. And, and like – I, you know, to try to work that out in my head, the, the the sort of thought experiment that worked for me was saints suffering from disease, right? So, a saint is a very holy person. You would ne certainly never say about them, "Well, they're suffering a disease because of their sins, because of their bad sins." Um, you you wouldn't say that, and certainly, you know, we're not going to say it's an illusion. Um, but we might be tempted to say, well, you know, their soul is in great shape, but their body, you know, or or God has allowed this to happen to them, y you know, whatever, right? Um, but th they are not partitioned out because they're still embodied humans. So uh, a saint might well feel, while they have maybe some major ailment, they might feel depression, they might feel the sense of spiritual struggle. Those things are going to go along with it. That doesn't mean they're any less holy. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. still a, a physical, spiritual, embodied, soulful, all at once thing. You know, it's it's all together. It's it's one. Yeah. If, you, if you're living with chronic pain, you're going to experience periods of depression. Yeah. And especially during those periods of depression, it's going to be hard to pray. Right. Or or maybe anger, which... Yes. I mean, anger is a spiritual experience too. Yeah. You know, it's all those things together. You know, and if, it's a if, spiritual if, and physical. It, it's spiritual and physical. Like you feel hot, you feel energized when you're angry. You know. Yeah, and you're gonna you're gonna if you're dealing with with crippling anxiety and stress, right? That's gonna have physical consequences. Yeah. To your physical body, that's going to do damage to your physical body. That's going to to make it again very difficult to pray. Yeah. Right, it's going to make it very I mean, difficult to focus. It's going to make it very difficult to to find time to attend church and, and and live the Christian life the way you know you should. Right, there's not a causative relationship here. Right, and right, all of this is real. None of it is illusory. Yeah, right? and 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 also, but it like, all overlaps. You're a whole yeah, person, exactly. Right? And and I mean, I think one of the reasons why people try to separate it out is because they're looking for solutions. 
right? So yeah. like, well, look, you've got a headache, just, you know, take the pill, um, you know, which, okay, it, you, you take a pill, you might well feel better. It's true. Um, but the experience is more than just a pain in your head. It's also all these other things at the same time, as we said. And so shouldn't you also be praying? Shouldn't you also be maybe dealing with like your, your headache might well be the, uh, connected to other things going on in your life, you know, shouldn't you also deal with them? You know, all those things together. Like if you just constantly treat the symptom, then you might not be dealing with the overall true disease. Right. And, and healing brought to one part of that, right? So certain people can only address certain parts of that. Yeah. So your local family doctor cannot address the spiritual part. Right. Probably not. I, as a priest, cannot address the physical part. Right. That's not your deal. Right. Like if you're if you've got low grade kidney failure, right? You need to go to a doc to a, a doctor, not to me. Right. Wait, While you're getting we, the treatment for kidney failure, I will come and talk to you and hear your confession right, and anoint are, you with are, oil. Are you saying people <laughs> like, who eat Cajun food might have kidney failure issues, or I don't know? I don't know. Dehydration from all the sweating <laughs> we do in August. I don't know. Right. Um, but but I mean, it should be emphasized, right, that what you can do for that person and what the kidney doctor does for that person are all from are both from God. Both of those things right. are from God, and are both things they need. Right. Right. Yeah. Just getting your physical health in order, if your mental and your spiritual health are out of whack, isn't going to do a lot of good for you because it's going to start failing too because these things overlap. Right. And vice versa. Right. When, when you, you're struggling with mental illness or physical illness, as that starts to be alleviated, that struggle starts to be alleviated and you get help with those things. One of the things that does is, for example, open up space for repentance. Hmm. For going and making amends, for going and, and dealing with things that you know you need to deal with as a Christian, but that you couldn't because of the other things that were going on, right? So these things all go together. Not only does the, the suffering overlap, right, and, and relate, but the healing, right, is holistic, and the healing overlaps. Right? And so what we're talking about when we're talking about healing in this full orb sense, the kind of healing that we're praying for when we perform the anointing of the sick, right? This is the restoration of the whole human person. So that includes your biological life, includes your spiritual life, the life of the soul, right? Which is the life of the body. It includes the health of the relationships, right? That you have with the world around you, right? And the people around you. It includes the restoration of your identity because your identity is formed out of those relationships and those interactions and those roles you play, right? Society. All of that is restored as you are healed. Mm. Right? Um, and so it's not just like, oh, my body is healed. My soul is healed. My mind is healed, right? You are healed. Yeah. The you that you are <laughs> is what's healed, right? So all that said, right, obviously, you know, there are a whole lot of people who receive the anointing of the sick and not only aren't healed immediately, sometimes aren't healed at all. Sometimes it's someone who's approaching physical death and even though they receive the anointing of the sick, they still die. Right. Yeah. So why is that? <laughs> right? Does God does God not want to hear heal people? Is there some stuff he can't heal? Uh is there something they did wrong to not receive the healing, right? Well, we've already ruled that last one out, right? Yeah, well and and, and just like <laughs> it, it's our practice generally to anoint people when we full well believe that they're dying. Yes. Yeah. 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 Is that like you do, know, a Hail Mary pass or whatever they were right. trying to do yeah. at that moment? And we don't do la in the Orthodox Church, we don't do last rites per se for right. our Roman Catholic friends. Uh, we do the anointing at various points, but that includes when someone's on their deathbed, we will go and give them the anointing of the sick. Right. Um, so our, our unction is less extreme, you might say. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, so, so why. 
Why is this? Well, you remember, and we've talked about this, I know, several times on the show, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, it is not good for man to live forever in this state. Oh, yeah, that. And it still isn't. Yeah. It still isn't. Right? St. Paul was still able to say, you know, it's better for me to depart <laughs> right, this life, but it's better for you if I stay. Right. Um, and so uh, it is not aimed at the, the sacrament of unction and God's healing in general is not aimed at keeping humans alive forever in this world. Lazarus died again later. Yeah, I mean, everybody but, who got raised died again later. Yeah. Um, all the people who Jesus healed died eventually. Right. Yep. Um, but the healing we receive in this life, the restoration we receive, the partial restoration we receive in this life, gives us more time to repent. Gives us more time in this world to serve the purpose of our life in this world, which is repentance which is transformation. But yeah. there's a point at which that is done. Right? Where the repentance we need to do is done or we've run out of chances. Mm. You God don't want to be gracious to us. We've run out of chances. But on the positive side that the that that what God required of us in terms of repentance, in terms of the good works he's given us to do in this world, etc., that's done. And then it is time for us for our life in this world to end. Um, and that is because the ultimate, the final restoration of the human person and our identity, where we really become who we are, <laughs> right, is in the bodily resurrection. That's what this is aimed at. So the healing we receive now is sort of a temporary measure. It's sort of a foretaste, right? It's a gift. It's a blessing, it's it's a little bit of an extension of our lives here to allow us to do what we need to do, right? But it's not a substitute. It's definitely not a way to try to avoid us moving on through death as Christ died to our bodily resurrection as he was raised from the dead. Yeah. Right. It's an anticipation of it, not a staving off of it. So as we wrap up, the first thing I want to say is I can't believe we're at almost, we're actually right at this moment under two hours. How about that? Maybe it's because we extracted a lot of giggling that we would have otherwise included. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but on a, on a much more serious note, um, there's a couple of things I want to leave everybody with. Um, so one is, if you've ever been at a Holy Unction service that I've served, you know, especially during the years that I was doing uh, pastoral ministry still, um, and I preached afterwards, which I did once in a while, I would often raise one question, which is, okay, we're all coming in here for this healing sacrament. Why is it that everybody is not walking out miraculously cured of whatever they walked in here with? Right. And that's even aside from the fact that most people who come into the unction service are probably relatively well in soul and relatively well in body anyway. Um, but, you know, especially as you get past middle age, you got something that hurts, probably. <laughs> something that's uncomfortable on a regular basis. Why doesn't holy unction just make that go away? Um, I mean, if you've listened up to this point, you probably know the answer to that, which is it's not that this is some kind of head fake on God's part. Like, yeah, yeah, this is the healing sacrament, but suckers, you know, most of you are not going to get healed most of the time. That's not it at all. That's not it at all. This sacrament is for the healing of soul and body. And, and it's not like, well, okay, well, we got the soul in, even though the body isn't really going <laughs> for anything at this point. No, that's not it at all. Because as we started out, what uh, who is a human you are a body you are an ensouled body an enlivened animated body 
It's who you are. And so the sacrament affects your body in all of the senses that that means, not just in terms of the materiality that we tend to think about when we think about the body, although including that for sure, but also, you know, frankly, see our body episodes, all of your powers, your potentialities, all those things together. So is it not working? It is. It is. But where is it's aiming? And the whole point of it is the resurrected person. It's aiming towards the resurrection. And how do you, how are you resurrected with the resurrection of life rather than the resurrection of damnation? You're raised to the resurrection of life by faithfulness to Christ, by holding fast to him, by always coming back to him. And that's what unction is for. It aims at that, at enabling you to do that in this life so that um, in the resurrection, you are who you're supposed to be in, 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 its, in your fullness. The second thing I wanted to mention, and that's related to the first for sure, is a lot more personal, but I know it's, but it's not exclusive to me because I know that probably a lot of you listening out there have experienced this. Um, so if you're married, there's a good chance that you and your spouse have experienced a miscarriage. Statistically, it's a really good chance. And that's a difficult thing to experience. Um, my wife and I have experienced that. And there's so many feelings that go along with that, right? It's not just a sense of a loss of potential. Like, you know, you're coming up with baby names. You're maybe outfitting a, a room. You're telling your other kids if you've got them. Um, it's, it's not just that, but there's also a sense of not quite knowing what to do with a person who died, but was never really present to you in the most palpable way. You know, uh, certainly mom feels the presence of that child in ways that nobody else does, but, and she's the one who suffers the most. Um, and there's a lot of things you can do to, to, to heal from that suffering. But, but that's not the thing that I want to talk about. Um, rather, I want to pass on to you something that was passed on to me that had obviously been passed on before. So in one of these experiences that, um, that we had, um, I was actually away from, from my wife at the time. We were not in the same part of the country. And, um, it was tough, very, very tough for that to be the, I mean, you know, we couldn't have planned for that. Um, and so I was, um, I was actually at an event with a number of other clergy and, um, uh, I ran into one of our, one of our bishops and I'll just go ahead and say who it was because I'm grateful that he did it for this. It was Bishop John. So if you're in the Antioch Inertia Diocese, you might know Bishop John. Um, and he says to me, how are you doing? And it wasn't just casual, you know, you ever talk to him, he's very, He's, he's a good pastor kind of all the time. And, uh, you know, I knew him. I know him. I've known him for years. And so I, I told him, I told him what had happened. And he passed this on to me. He said, you know, have you ever heard what Father Thomas Hopko used to say about this situation? And I said, you know what? I have not. And he said, and, and now I'm not passing this on to you to tell you that this is some kind of dogmatic teaching, but it's something that I believe is true. Okay, that's where I'm going to put it. He said this. God gives everyone everything that they need in order to be saved. Everyone in this world, God gives them everything that they need. Everything in your life is there for you, for your salvation. And if you use it, you'll be saved. You have what you need. Um, and what Father Thomas Hopko would say is that when, when God takes someone like this, in this situ situation, the situation of miscarriage, it's because that person already has, they're already fit. They're already ready to go. And so it's, it's their moment. God is already receiving them. Again, I'm not saying this is some kind of dogmatic teaching. If you don't believe this, you're not Christian or not Orthodox or whatever. But 
I think that this aims at a lot of what we're talking about, that the ultimate goal for us as creations of God is to be with him, is to be fit to be with him, to be prepared to be with him. And that's what unction is aimed at. That's what unction is for. Just because we don't walk away with miracle cures doesn't mean it's not working. Just as with any of the other sacraments, just because you don't walk away glowing or, or whatever doesn't mean it's not working. It's making you more and more fit for the kingdom of God, more and more fit ultimately for the resurrection, for this embodied whole humanity cured of corruption with God forever. That's what it's for. Father Stephen? You do need to speak for yourself a little bit. I am positively radiant nearly all the time. <laughs> that is the adjective I think that best describes me in most people's minds. <laughs> um, so earlier when we were talking, uh, I made a reference to essence not preceding existence, right? That, that who you are does not precede the life you live. And our uh, more philosophically inclined or francophilic uh, listeners may have caught a sort of reference to Jean-Paul Sartre and his famous among nerds uh, axiom that uh, existence precedes essence. Mm. And by that, he meant uh, that we sort of come into being and we aren't anything in particular. And as we make choices in our life, those choices define who we are. And he used the example at one point of how you can compose your life like a melody through the choices you make. Um, and, you know, I mean, that sounds nice, but it's the opposite extreme. Right. It's the opposite extreme. So on one side, you have those who would tell us that, you know, at, before you're even born, right, you are X, you will always be X. X is just going to play out over your life, right? On the other side, you have people who, like Jean-Paul Sartre, who are so obsessed with the idea of ultimate freedom uh, that they're not willing to acknowledge you know, that you're born in a particular place in a particular time in a particular body with particular genetics and a particular heritage. And you speak a particular language and that shapes how you think about things and how you see the world. And you have particular experiences early in life that aren't subject to your control, right? He wants to ignore all of that, right? And in between, we have one of the truths we were kind of trying to get at in this episode, uh, coming back to what Father Staniloy said about a human person being in some sense absolute because uh, that quality that God has given to us, that he's built into our constitution of being able to step outside of, to evaluate and I won't go down this rabbit hole now, but you can go back to the episode. This is really a function of the news, of, of reason in the truest sense. Um, to look at our lives, to, like the prodigal son, come to our senses. Um, that is something that we possess as a capacity, as part of our human nature, at every moment of our lives. Not just at the first moment. Or at the early moments. But until the very last moment when we draw our last breath. Meaning, no matter how you've spent the last umpteen years. No matter who you've been. No matter how distorted that is. No matter how much guilt that's heaped upon you, no matter how much you've hurt yourself and other people, no matter how much damage you've done, 
no matter what people think of you, no matter what you think of yourself, that can all change. You can break character. You don't have to keep playing the part you've been playing. You don't have to keep operating within the relationships and the patterns that you've been operating in. But that's also not, again, contra at least one reading of Sartre, not something you do by snapping your fingers. That's not something you can declare. It's not something you can wake up one day and just say, okay, done with all that. I'm a whole new person now. It starts there. And then it takes a lot of work. The work of repentance, the work of making new choices, the work of repairing damaged relationships, of repairing loss of respect from other people and for yourself. Uh, the work of making peace where you've been making conflict and trying to win. The work of uh, being healed as a whole and complete person in every way transforming yourself, transforming your life. Because again, identity is not found back before our birth. It's not found at our birth. It's not found at some high point in our life, age 30, age 40, right? It's found at the point of the bodily resurrection. That is the point in our life and our existence where we most truly will be who we are. And until then, we are actively shaping that, actively transforming that, and free not to pivot on a dime, free not from the consequences of our past actions, as if they can just be brushed aside, but free to begin the work of becoming that person who we want to be on that day instead of the person who we may have been. Amen. Amen. Well, that is our show for tonight. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. If you didn't get through to us live, you, we would still love to hear from you. You can email us at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com. You can message us at our Facebook page, or you can leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash lordofspirits. And join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Then I put my codes in the machine, but the world I found was made of faulty dreams. If you are on Facebook, that dark, dark place, <laughs> but not as dark as Twitter. Follow our page and join our discussion group. Leave reviews and ratings everywhere. But most importantly, share this show with a friend who is going to benefit from it. And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com stroke support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the air. Fly out of the doldrums and recall the log from the early database of your love. Thank you. Good night. And may God bless you. been listening to the Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12.